Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The ARRL Hudson Division Director promotes the Amateur Radio Parity Act before a Senate committee. The ARRL Board of Directors re-elects Rick Roderick, K5UR, as League President and elects others to office. We will have a complete report. The League Board of Directors agrees to a review of its conduct code for directors. A new amendment to the ARRL DXCC rules will expand the DXCC list. A new Pacific Division Vice Director is appointed. If you are like most new hams, you operate a digital mode, and we will look at a new mode usage evaluation that says 2017 is the year digital modes changed forever. A new amateur radio satellite is commissioned and ready for amateur use. And those pesky number stations persist on the HF bands. We will take a quick look at them in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, discusses a new type of GPS called What Three Words and talks about wear leveling on solid state memory devices. Australia's own Anil Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to introduce you to GNU Virtual Radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his amateur radio history headlines. And the folks from The Rain Report will take us back in time to revisit some controversial editorials from Mark, WB9QZB. That's all straight ahead as edition number 987 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from sunny Albany, New York, where we actually had a sunny day today instead of those usual gray New York days, I'm W2XBS. From our studio, high atop the eastern Alleghenies near Altoona, Pennsylvania, I'm Wayne Nelms, N3LMS. And reporting from the western Catskills, where a large brown deer is now eating in my garden, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from Studio One in our Central Florida News Bureau, where I'm very happy to say the weather has gotten a bit warmer, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. We have late breaking news as we go to air. ARRL Hudson Division Director Mike Lysenko, N2YBB, testified Thursday, January 25th, before a session of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation regarding amateur radio's readiness to respond in an emergency. The session, This Is Not a Drill, an examination of emergency alert systems, was called in the wake of an incoming missile warning erroneously released in Hawaii earlier this month. Lysenko said amateur radio played a role not only in responding to the warning, but in disseminating word that the missile alert had been issued by mistake. Lysenko said the Hawaii Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service activated on UHF and also via a VHF inter-island repeater network, and amateur stations monitored the alert and cancellation activity which came less than one day after RACES had completed an amateur radio communication exercise at the State Emergency Operations Center. In his written testimony, Lysenko recounted that the situation after the missile warning in Hawaii was chaotic. The phone lines into the state EOC were soon overwhelmed and congested, and the website was overwhelmed with public inquiries. Lysenko went on to say that in such situations, Amateur radio volunteers typically are present at state or county EOCs and at the state warning point, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. He pointed out that the cancellation of the false warning circulated on various information outlets 13 minutes after the missile warning went out. In written testimony, Lysenko told the committee that was picked up and relayed through the amateur radio networks. The cell phone alert system could not be used for the cancellation notice until prior FEMA approval was obtained. Once that was obtained, the cancellation alert went out to the cell phone network after 38 minutes from the initial alert. 
Many people had received the warning first on their cell phones through the wireless emergency alert system, but a cancellation on that same system was substantially delayed, Lysenko said. The result was that amateur radio networks disseminated validated cancellation information long before the cellular networks were able to do so. Lysenko took the opportunity to address how private land use regulations can preclude amateur radio disaster response capabilities. Lysenko explained, There is no substitute for the ready availability of a residential amateur radio station in daily operation from a licensee's residence. The licensee cannot be expected to have the ability to communicate into or from a disaster site unless he or she has a station with an effective outdoor antenna capable of operation on multiple frequency bands at once, which is ready to be pressed into service from the licensee's residence at a moment's notice. Lysenko reminded the panel members that the Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017 is now pending before the committee. Senate Bill 1534 is a balanced, completely bipartisan bill that would fully protect both the entitlement of amateur radio volunteers to provide emergency, disaster relief, and public service communications while protecting the aesthetic concerns and the jurisdiction of homeowners associations, noting that the bill is unopposed. We are in desperate need of this legislation, and without it, the volunteer emergency communication services provided by amateur radio will be precluded. Lysenko iterated, we urge the committee in the strongest terms to please approve and send this legislation forward without delay. Mississippi Senator Roger Wicker, a co-sponsor with Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal of the Amateur Radio Parity Act, attended the hearing. Responding to a question from Wicker at the hearing, Lysenko pointed out that an early U.S. Coast Guard warning cancellation notice was relayed to amateur radio networks and disseminated quickly, while the state warning point waited to obtain FEMA authorization to rescind the warning via cellular phones. As a result, amateur radio networks were able to disseminate validated cancellation information long before the cellular networks were able to do so. Wicker issued a statement noting Lysenko's testimony and posted a video clip of his exchange with Lysenko. South Dakota Senator John Thune, who chairs the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, convened the hearing, called to examine policy concerns surrounding the use and effectiveness of emergency alert systems, including wireless emergency alerts, as well as recent system failures, including, but not limited to, the mistaken missile alert in Hawaii. Incumbent AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, has been re-elected by the League's Board of Directors for a second term. The board convened for its annual meeting January 19th and 20th. For more details on the election, we go to League headquarters in Newington, where Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, files this report. President Roderick, the League's 16th president, received nine votes, while the only other nominee, New England Director Tom Frenet, K1KI, received six votes. Chief Financial Officer Barry Shelley, N1VXY, was elected as Chief Executive Officer, replacing Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, who announced his retirement on January 18th after two years at ARRL headquarters. Shelley will serve until the board selects a new CEO and is expected to serve in an advisory role to assist with the transition beyond that. The board has created a CEO search committee. ARRL controller Diane Middleton, KC1BQF, was elected chief financial officer, replacing Shelley. ARRL first vice president Greg Wyden, K0GW, was declared re-elected without opposition. Incumbent ARRL second vice president Brian Milshowski, N5ZGT, did not stand for re-election, and Pacific Division Director Bob Valio, W6RGG, was elected to succeed him. Pacific Division Vice Director Jim Teamstra, K6JAT, will succeed Valio as Pacific Division Director. The Vice Director vacancy there will be filled by appointment. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. In other election news, incumbent Vice President for International Affairs, Jay Bellows, K0QB, was unopposed for re-election. Incumbent AWRL Treasurer Rick Neuswander, K7GM, was re-elected without opposition. The board elected current AWRL Comptroller Diane Middleton, KC1BQF, as Chief Financial Officer to replace Shelley. The board also chose members for its executive committee, 
Elected to the EC on the first ballot were New Dakota Division Director Matt Holden, K0BBC, Director Frenai, Roanoke Division Director Jim Boner, and 2 zz and Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK. Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, was elected on the fourth ballot to fill the remaining slot. The board elected directors Milhoski, Norris, and Frenai with new three-year terms on the ARRL Foundation Board. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The ARRL Board of Directors took action on a number of items at its annual meeting held on January 19th and 20th in Windsor, Connecticut, including adopting a motion to review the entire Code of Conduct for board members, known officially as the ARRL Policy on Board Governance and Conduct of Members of the Board of Directors and Vice Directors. ARRL officers, directors, and vice directors will review the Code of Conduct and complete a final draft version 60 days ahead of the board's July 2018 meeting. In the same motion, the board deleted and suspended sections that were considered ambiguous and in conflict with the intent of the Code of Conduct, requiring board members to act in the best interest of the League's membership. The board also voted unanimously to amend a policy affecting candidates for ARRL elected offices, including directors and vice directors. The new policy calls for candidates to be informed in writing at the outset of nomination process that decisions of the board's Ethics and Elections Committee concerning candidate eligibility will be made public unless the candidate requests otherwise. In addition, if the Ethics and Elections Committee rejects a candidate's position, the candidate may ask that the reasons for rejection not be made public. Unless confidentiality is requested within 10 business days, the reasons for rejection may be made public. A proposed addition to the ARRL Articles of Association regarding the personal liability and indemnification of directors will be reviewed by the Executive Committee, the General Counsel, and the ARRL Connecticut Corporate Council. Proposed amendments to the ARRL bylaws regarding life membership were referred to the Administration and Finance Committee for further consideration. It was decided that if these or any additional changes are proposed, they will be made available to the membership and will be accompanied by explanatory white papers before the board considers action on them. In other action, the board approved the motion requiring that minutes of the board meetings be published only after being formally approved by the board. The board unanimously adopted ARRL's 2018-2019 financial plan. Up to $30,000 was allocated to fund the discovery and strategy phase of the Lifelong Learning Initiative. The board will receive a progress report on the project at its July meeting. Addressing administrative matters, the board unanimously adopted a motion to form a CEO search committee to identify a candidate for chief executive office for board election. The committee, which is authorized to engage a search consultant, will report periodically to the board and at the July meeting. Committee members will include Treasurer Rick Niswander, K7GM as Chairman, Central Division Director Kermit Carlson, W9XA, Roanoke Division Director Jim Boehner, N2ZZ, West Gulf Coast Division Director Dr. David Woolweaver, K5RAV, and First Vice President Greg Wedden, K0GW. Attention all contesters! The ARRL Board of Directors approved a motion to amend the DXCC rules when it met January 19th and 20th. Section 2, subsection 1 of the DXCC rules now will include a new subsection D. The entity has a separate IARU member society and is included in the U.S. State Department independent states in the world. According to ARRL Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, the discussion during the board meeting and the rule change did not address any specific entity. The amendment could allow some additions to the current DXCC list of entities. It's a good thing not only for DXCC, but for all active hams. In fact, the Republic of Kosovo, Z6, has been added to the DXCC list of current entities, increasing the total number of current DXCC entities to 340. The addition of Kosovo raises to 331 the required number of current entities confirmed to qualify for DXCC honor roll. Top of honor roll is 340. 
DXCC award accounts are being tabulated to reflect the change. This change qualifies as an event effective on January 21, 2018 at 0 hundred hours UTC. Nothing is retroactive. A new logbook of the world TQSL configuration file was released on January 23rd. TQSL will detect when this file has been released and will install the update automatically. Radio amateurs outside of Kosovo should continue to upload their logs to Logbook of the World in the usual manner. Logbook of the World users within Kosovo, either with a Z6 call sign or reciprocal call sign, Z6 slash home call sign, will use TQSL to request a new call sign certificate for their call sign. The request will use Republic of Kosovo as the DXCC entity, and the QSO begin date will be January 1st or later. Logbook of the World will reject call sign certificate requests for the Republic of Kosovo with a QSO begin date prior to January 21st. Z6 users requesting call sign certificates may email a copy of their amateur radio license. Kosovo's IARU member society and its president, Bjolka Keika, Z61VB, are hosting a 10th anniversary activation to celebrate Kosovo's independence in February 2008. SHRAK headquarters station, Z60A, now is active on several bands with multiple guest operators. Club log will be used for this activation, while QSLs are via OH2BH. Kristen McIntyre, K6WX of Fremont, California, has been appointed Pacific Division Vice Director. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, has announced. The appointment came upon the recommendation of Director Jim Teamstra, K6AT, who succeeded longtime Pacific Division Director Bob Valio, W6RGG, upon Valio's election as ARRL Second Vice President. McIntyre, who has served on ARRL as technical coordinator for the East Bay section, says on her QRZ.com profile that she's been interested in radio since she was about five years old. She got her technician's ticket in the late 70s while a student at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and after letting her license expire, she relicensed and obtained her amateur extra. She's also licensed in Japan, her second home, as JI1IZZ, McIntyre is president of the Palo Alto Amateur Radio Club and is a senior software engineer at Apple. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Clark Burgard, N1BCG. And Clark, coming up uh, next weekend is the AM Rally. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, hi, Steve. Thanks a lot for having me on. The AM Rally is, is a very unique experience. It's an event which is designed to... Uh, promote the first radio voice mode, uh, and being that AM is part of just about every transceiver or transmitter that is available today and in the past, a lot of people have the mode, but um, what we want to do is have an event that promotes the use of it. It may not be as familiar as sideband or two-meter FM or CW, but it's, uh, it's a legacy mode, and um, the AM rally is, is really all about getting people to try it out, maybe for the first time. Would you call it a contest? No, not so much of a contest. There are awards for the most contacts and a very, uh, a various uh, number of other uh, scores that you can get on it, but it's really just more of a fun, casual event uh, to have people say, hey, you know, I've got this AM button. There's a lot of people on this weekend using AM. Let me give it a shot, and, and hopefully people will get their rigs adjusted up front before the event starts, and uh, even when the event's running, there will be people to help them get it set up. So anybody with any transceiver that can operate AM can participate. I mean, even I could, right? <laughs> well, anybody can. Yeah, of course. You just have to be able to uh, put out a double sideband signal with, <laughs> with a carrier, basically AM, and, um, and give it a shot. So uh, there are some folks who have never been on AM before, and there's some people who well, I'll give you an example. Last year, we had um, one person I heard personally who said that he got his uh, DX100 off the shelf after 35 years wow. just to try it out for the AM rally. And that, that, that was sort of his big re, reintroduction to the AM mode. So it was, it was fun to hear things like that. And I've got a software-defined transceiver, but it does do AM, so that would be okay. All of it. There are people who are using... Uh, modern solid state gear. There's people using tr uh, tube transmitters from the 50s, broadcast transmitters, 
homemade um, class class E and D transmitters. So it's it's the full gamut, everything. When does it start? Uh, what day and what time? Yeah, it'll be February second. Uh, uh, at 7 p.m., and it'll go until uh, actually Monday morning early, but for most folks in the United States, it's generally Friday night to Sunday night. Excellent. Well, I'll give it a try. Yeah, and the uh, website for more information is amrally.com, A-M-R-A-L-L-Y.com. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The ARRL Board of Directors has conferred the 2018 International Humanitarian Award jointly on the amateur radio population of Puerto Rico, served by ARL Section Manager Oscar Resto, KP4RF, and the Radio Amateurs of the U.S. Virgin Islands, served by the ARRL Section Manager Fred Kleber, K9VV. For further details, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Radio amateurs in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. Virgin Islands aided in the relief and recovery after a punishing hurricane season in the Caribbean. The board noted that radio amateurs in Puerto Rico and on the U.S. Virgin Islands were pressed into immediate service before and during the devastating storms throughout 2017 hurricane season. ARRL established the International Humanitarian Award to recognize outstanding amateur radio operators in areas of international humanitarianism. In a separate motion, the board recognized the outstanding work and service and commended all involved with the various hurricane relief communication efforts during 2017. The board cited the amateur radio communities of Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, the Caribbean Islands, and in South Florida and Texas for outstanding service during the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, calling their efforts a demonstrable exhibition of amateur radio public service. In other action, the board conferred the 2017 Doug DeMa W1FB Technical Excellence Award on Joe Taylor, K1JT, Steve Frank, K9AN, and Bill Somerville, G4WJS, for their articles Work the World with WSJTX Parts 1 and 2, which appeared in QST for October and November 2017. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. The efforts of the local amateur communities continue to support the relief and recovery efforts even now, the board said, and the ARRL leadership in each section continues to do extraordinary service to their communities. Club log author and UK radio amateur Michael Wells, G7VJR, has reported that data compiled from 8,000 club log users indicates the proportion of FT8 usage relative to other modes has risen dramatically since FT8's introduction last year. Every few years, Wells has posted charts depicting mode usage on the amateur bands based on log data uploaded to Club Log. Graphs he posted last week show the proportion of contacts on each mode for the last 20 years and then for the last 12 months. According to Wells, 2017 was, of course, the year when digital modes changed forever with the advent of FT8. It is a remarkable technical achievement which has breathed life and enthusiasm into DXing for a whole new audience. Now out of beta testing, FT8 continues to capture the imagination of the amateur radio community, luring away many of those who had been using the popular JT65 weak signal mode. FT8 included WSJT-X version 1.8.0-RC3 with several refinements from the original beta release. Among FT8's biggest advantages is a shorter transmit-receive cycle, with contacts four times faster than with JT65 or JT9. An entire FT8 contact can take place in about a minute. Many de-expeditions now routinely include FT8 operation. The new mode is named after its developers Stephen Frank, K9AN, and Joe Taylor, K1JT. The numeral designates the mode's 8-frequency shift-keying format. Tones are spaced at 6.25 Hz, and an FT8 signal occupies just 50 Hz. Wells reported that 8,000 Club Log users uploaded FT8 contacts last year, logging 46,000 discrete call signs in that mode. For reference, in 2017, the total number of QSOs uploaded to Club Log in all modes was 32 million. 
Well said, of that total, the number of QSOs made with FT-8 was 4.8 million. That works out to 15% of all contacts posted to Clublog, which may or may not be representative of amateur radio activity at large. Wells' graph for 2017 shows a dramatic increase in mid-2017 in the percentage of FT-8 contact relative to other modes. By year's end, overtaking CW and single sideband usage, already trending downward except for a significant bump in CW usage toward the end of the year. RTTY and PSK31 usage remain comparatively stable over the course of 2017. The usage of other undefined modes declined dramatically after the introduction of FT8. Wells explained it this way to ARRL, on any given day, the graph shows the percentage of QSOs logged with a particular mode plotted for a year. Say 100 QSOs were made on Wednesday, then 55 of them were on FT8. It is not showing absolute levels of activity, just relative levels of activity. Wells pointed out that the data is smooth and the values are for a 28-day moving average. Therefore, a weekend of only CW and no FT8 has little effect. The trend is gradually adjusting by ongoing activity and not by shocks. Last fall, Taylor expressed some surprise about the rapid uptake in the use of FT8 on HF. Rather than viewing FT8 as a game changer, however, Taylor told ARRL that he sees a dividing line between such digital modes and more traditional modes. As he sees it, single sideband and CW are general purpose modes suitable for rag chewing, DXing, contesting, emergency communications, or whatever. FT8 and other modes in WSJT-X are special purpose modes, Taylor said. They are designed for making reliable, error-free contacts using very weak signals in particular, signals that may be too weak for the more traditional modes to be usable, or even too weak to hear. Taylor pointed out that the level of information exchanged in most FT8 and other similar digital modes isn't much more than the bare minimum for a valid contact. In addition to call signs and signal reports, stations may exchange grid squares and acknowledgments. AMSAT Vice President Operations Drew Glasbrenner, K04MA, has declared that FOX 1D, or its official designation is AO92, is now open for general amateur radio use. That word followed an announcement from AMSAT Vice President of Engineering Jerry Buxton in 0JY that AO92 has been commissioned and formally turned over to AMSAT operations. Initially, the U-V-FM transponder will be continuously open for one week. After that, the operation will be shared among the UV-FM transponder, L-band downshifter, Virginia Tech camera, and the University of Iowa's High Energy Radiation CubeSat instrument, or HERSI. The AMSAT News Service, AMSAT BB, and AMSAT's Twitter account, at AMSAT, the AMSAT-NA Facebook group, and the AMSAT website will report any updates. AO92 was launched from India January 12th. The past two weeks, the AMSAT Engineering and Operations teams have been testing the various modes and experiments on board. Testing has shown that both the UV-FM transponder and L-band downshifter are working well. The Virginia Tech camera has returned photos of Earth, and data from Hersey has been successfully downlinked. AMSAT thanked the 178 stations around the world that used Fox Telem to collect telemetry and experiment data from AO92 during the commissioning process. Hello, Americans. This is Paul Harvey. In any national emergency, for all of our sophisticated technology, in any real disaster, our country still relies heavily on its hams. Amateur radio hobbyists, ready, willing, and able to coordinate search and rescue or whatever, to work with the Red Cross and the Salvation Army or whomever to keep us, U.S., informed to a degree that regular commercial radio stations just cannot. These unsung heroes get little mention or attention. President Bush has called on citizen involvement in civic activities. He has urged citizen involvement. Well, that includes a lot of people, a lot of organizations, but none more unsung and certainly none more unpaid than the hams standing by around the clock. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air.
And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let me just log in here to my computer. And let's see, what is, uh, what is new in the tech world? There's a, there's a company, it's actually, I want to say a new company, but it's new to me. And it's going to be new to a lot of Mercedes-Benz owners next year called What Three Words. I, I love this idea. Instead, you know, the way it works now, if you want to uh, use GPS to locate uh, something, you could enter a street address. If it had a street address, not everything does. Famously, Venice in Italy, they don't have, they don't have street numbers. I'd hate to be a, a mailman in Venice. It's the third house on the left past the canal. Take a right at the gondola. And there you are, the red one, not the blue one. That's the kind of, <laughs> apparently, the kind of addresses they have to do. You could use GPS coordinates. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's 403215 by 627448. That's even worse. That's worse than a phone number. So I love this idea. What three words they thought, well, you know what we could do? <laughs> Some British guys, of course. You know what we could do? What if we divided the world... <laughs> up into three meter grids about 10 feet by 10 feet 100 square feet just divided the whole world up into 100 square feet squares and we assign a unique three words to each square turns out you could do that if you have a vocabulary of 40,000 words so it's 40,000 by 40,000 by 40,000 would give you a unique location for every 100 square feet in the world and they did it and the idea is, well, now what you can do is you can say, well, for instance, our uh, our studio, what was it? No, see, I, I've forgotten already. It's like Brillo Nasal Tweak or something like that. It was three words. Chair, trumpet, window. Three words. And then those three words can narrow it down. You probably want to do the front door because it's actually better than addresses in the sense that uh, you could, uh, you know, say, well, if the back of the place is a different three words, right? Than the, than the front of the place. If you go to uh, map.what3words.com. Actually, let me just look up our address. Because I'm, cu I'm curious now. I'm going to look up my company's address. Glow Walnut Nasal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually getting... A, they, they for, for a fee, or actually for free, they have different signs. They'll print up. I'm getting a sign printed up. I'm going to hang out on the wall behind me. Glow Walnut Nasal. So when people, you know... Now, you might say, well, okay, that's great, but who do I say glow walnut nasal to? Well, you could go, you could have the app on your phone and say glow walnut wet nasal, and then it would open Google Maps or Apple Maps or Waze or some other mapping application. It would go there. It would actually set what it does is it the, the What Three Words app looks up the longitude and latitude and then sends it there. Or you, if you have a, the new Mercedes, I guess starting next year, you, you, know, you press the button and say glow walnut nasal, taking you there now. That's all you, what do you think? Are you better with words or numbers? See, my wife says, no, give me the numbers. I want the street address. But I like low walnut nasal. Of course, I can't remember it, can I? I'll, uh, that's why I need a sign. <laughs> oh, Scooter X says it's animation deadline imaged. I guess glow walnut nasal is the back window, the back of the place. <laughs> Maybe I ordered the wrong, <laughs> I ordered the wrong sign. Animation <clears throat> deadline imaged. Thank you, Scooter X. <laughs> uh, I just I thought that was kind of cool I just I like that idea just kind of a different way computers of course are better uh, aren't they at um, numbers but that doesn't mean that everything has to be numbers we can they're also good at translating things like words into numbers so let this is kind of my philosophy let the computer adjust to me First 20 years of uh, technology, it's really been us adjusting to that. Even with a Amazon Echo, you have to, or a Google, you kind of have to adjust to it, right? What is, what can, how do I have to say it exactly right? Soon, though, I hope, will come a day where they adjust to us. You just say what you're thinking and it'll understand. Wouldn't that be nice? Speaking of words, the city of, can I say it? I may, may not be legally allowed to say it, Sarajevo, uh, on the Balkan Peninsula, the, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina has copyrighted its name <laughs> and you can't 
legal and private entities that use the emblem and name of the city of Sarajevo without the permission to do so from the regulatory body or against the issued permission. And this decision about the usage of the emblem, name, and flag of the city of Sarajevo have an obligation to pay for the damage caused by such behavior to the city of Sarajevo. Guess I won't be saying that anymore. They could sue you for using their name. How stupid is that? The Eiffel Tower, same thing. Now, well, it turns out, so the Eiffel Tower, because it was built so long ago, uh, what was it, 1873, something like that, 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 has, uh, that has expired. The copyright has expired to the Eiffel Tower. But <laughs> they put lights on the Eiffel Tower in, uh, in 19, for the 100th anniversary in 1990 or something like that. So I guess it was 1890 they built the Eiffel Tower. They put uh, lights on it. Those lights are copyrighted. So, according to the French court, you can take pictures and disseminate pictures of the Eiffel Tower during the day. It doesn't violate any copyright. But the city of Paris says you can't take pictures of and distribute them for, for commercial purposes at night because of the lights. Because of the lights. <laughs> now, here's why I think it's dumb. I, I, you see the same thing, and it's changing, but I, you go to a museum and they say, Abs no, no, you know, you pull out your phone to take a picture. They say, no. And I'm not sure really what they care. Why do they care, right? Well, we want to sell you the catalog on the way out. Well, those are better pictures anyway than my smartphone picture. And what they don't take into account is Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Isn't it better for the museum and the city of Sarajevo and the Eiffel Tower if people share their pictures on social networks? Doesn't that raise awareness? Here's a beautiful picture of the city of Sarajevo, but I can't use the name, so you just have to guess where it is. <laughs> you see this? You see, I've, one of the things, I think I learned this yesterday. I've, I've spoken about this before. Technology is changing so rapidly that our, our ideas are just not keeping up, even in the way we use technology. We, I talked yesterday to a woman who had a Chromebook, one of these great devices from um, Google, that I you know recommend for a lot of people because they're very secure. And, they, and you don't have to worry about backup because they store everything in the cloud unless they do have a little bit of memory, like 16 gigs of storage. You store stuff on the drive. And she had done that and couldn't get into her Chromebook. And I said, well, why did you do that? Well, isn't that what you do with a computer? Yes. That's the old way of thinking. We've got to think of new, new ways of thinking. You don't store anything on your Chromebook locally. You store it on the drive. Are you? I think we're all doing stuff like that. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? So D-Ban, Derek's boot and nuke. Was, it really comes from the spinning drive era when you could write, basically in the old days, the traditional hard drives, they wrote sequentially. So you write to the sector, then the next sector, the next sector, and the next sector. Uh, and D-Ban works that way. It would write a one to a sector, then erase it, then a zero to a sector any number of times. You specify the number of times. Theory being, no one's going to ever be able to read this hard drive. You've completely erased it. Solid state drives don't work the same way because they need to do something called wear leveling. When the cells on a solid state hard drive get written to too many times, they wear out. So in order to make a solid state hard drive be as reliable as a spinning drive, and by the way, I want to be clear up front, they are, they had to change how they wrote to them. So they do two things. They over-provision the drive. They give it actually more memory than they, you know, a gigabyte drive might have 1.2 gigabytes. They give it more storage than, uh, than advertised. And they write to the cells in a random way, doing something called wear leveling. They're trying to level out the amount of wear any given cell gets. But that means it's a little more difficult to fully erase a solid state drive. And in fact, Security experts warn that you can't fully erase a solid-state drive. In other words, it's safe to run D-Ban against it, but it may not do what you think it's going to do. You can't get all the little bits of information. They're strewn all over the drive in a way that isn't rewritable. So if you, even if, even a hybrid drive, you're talking about a hybrid drive, which is a popular uh, technology nowadays where they mix solid state with spinning drives. Even a hybrid drive has some solid state there is there's the potential for some data leakage, even with something like D-Ban running against it. So our advice really, and this is going to be the way most computers will work going forward because they have enough power to do this, is to, before you put anything on a drive, encrypt it. Use the built-in encryption in Windows called BitLocker, in Apple's Mac OS called FileVault, 
And if you use do it from the day one, then even though some data will still be there, it'll be nonsense data. It won't be useful unless you have the decryption key. So that doesn't mean don't use DBAN because it's going to get rid of most of it. But don't assume that DBAN is 100% successful, I guess, is the bottom line on that one. I hope that that makes sense because it's a fairly important uh, concept, something we kind of need to know about that's very different. This is kind of what's happened in computing. Our paradigm, the way we understand how computing works, has drastically changed. And companies really haven't, they don't want to confuse anybody. So they pretend that a solid state drive roughly works the same as a spinning drive. It ain't true. And, and any, even on your phone, by the way, which uses solid state memory exclusively, it's impossible to fully erase it. So, but that's why almost all phones now have encryption by default. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio. There is a feeling of anticipation in the air. The year has started. There are so many different ideas bubbling through my mind that I feel like an excited puppy dog wagging its tail. I've been playing with a wonderful piece of software called GNU Radio. More on that in a moment. So I have for a while been dissatisfied with the offerings of SDR software. There is lots of development going on, lots of new toys being invented, and many different hives of activity in this area. It's not unlike the progression from reel-to-reel -reel based radio broadcasting via VHS tape to computers with audio files. There are lots of solutions solving specific problems. But there are also a group of solutions looking for a problem, and only time will sift out which one is worth the effort. In amateur radio, we deal with valves, resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors, integrated circuits, crystals, connectors, solder, and many, many different physical things. I'm a computer guy, have been since I was in primary school. I grok computers, more so than any aspect of anything else. Amateur radio was intended as an escape from this world. But initially to my dismay, but now to my delight, computers are making serious inroads into the hobby. Not just as peripherals that take care of logging, messaging, propagation, forecasting and the like, but as integral parts of the radio. I looked at GNU Radio several years ago and wasn't able to understand what it did and how it worked. I didn't have enough in the way of radio skills or vocabulary to get started. But in learning about my hobby, I now have a much better understanding. GNU Radio is a tool, a piece of open source software that allows you to build circuits inside a computer that process information. Not unlike how filters, amplifiers and oscillators do this inside a physical radio. If you want to change the behavior of a radio, you need to alter a circuit by changing components or redesign the circuit entirely and rebuild it. Hours of planning, soldering, testing and the like, just on a hunch or an idea. It's how we've been doing development for centuries. GNU Radio allows you to tweak a radio on the spot, in real time, and see what it does. The feedback loop is immediate. You build up a sequence of blocks, an oscillator, a filter, a combiner, splitter, decoder, spectrogram, waterfall, whatever. And if you need it to do something else, you either swap out one of the blocks or change one or more parameters. Better still, replace a fixed parameter with a slider so you can change it while it's running to see what happens. For example, displaying a Lisa Shoe figure in the real world involves two signal generators, cables, an oscilloscope, power, gain settings, timing, several hundred if not thousand dollars worth of gear. In GNU Radio, it involves two signal source blocks and an oscilloscope block joined together. All there, three blocks, two lines, and it's working. Making an FM receiver in GNU Radio involves a source of radio frequency information, say a $20 RTL TV dongle, and an FM decoder block. You can display it on a waterfall with a third block, or listen to it with an audio block. To make matters even more interesting, you can build your own blocks, transmit if your radio is capable, and test all of this without ever needing to go to the local electronics store or heat up a soldering iron. I have no doubt that this changes amateur radio for me, and I'm fairly sure it will do the same for you. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment 
with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. AWRL invites nominations for awards that recognize educational and technological pursuits in amateur radio. Nominations are also open for the league's premier award to honor a young licensee, the Hiram Percy Maxim Award. The Hiram Percy Maxim Award recognizes a radio amateur, an AWRL member under the age of 21, whose accomplishments and contributions are the most exemplary nature within the framework of amateur radio activities. Nominations for this award need to be made through the nominator's AWRL section manager, who will forward the nominations to AWRL headquarters by March 31st, 2018. The AWRL Herb S. Breyer Instructor of the Year Award honors an AWRL volunteer amateur radio instructor or an AWRL professional classroom teacher who uses creative instructional approaches and reflects the highest values of the amateur radio community. The award highlights quality of and commitment to licensing instruction. Nominations are due by March 15, 2018. The AWRL Microwave Award pays tribute to a radio amateur or group of radio amateurs who contribute to the development of the amateur radio microwave bands. The nomination deadline for that is March 31, 2018. The AWRL Technal Service Award recognizes a radio amateur or a group of radio amateurs who provide amateur radio technical assistance or training to others. The nomination for deadline is March 31, 2018. The AWRL Technical Innovation Award is granted to a radio amateur or a group of radio amateurs who develop and apply new technical ideas or techniques in amateur radio. The nomination deadline is March 31, 2018. The Knight Distinguished Service Award was established to recognize exceptionally notable contributions by a section manager to the health and vitality of the AWRL. The nomination deadline is April 30, 2018. The AWRL Board of Directors selects recipients for these awards. Winners are typically announced following the board's July meeting. More information about these awards is available on the AWRL website. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1921, the National Amateur Wireless Association becomes active. Its main success is the broadcast of the Dempsey Carpenter fight. Many amateurs helped in this broadcast, from acting as relay stations to setting up receivers and loudspeakers in public places. 1921 through 1922. The transatlantic tests are a success. Amateurs discover that frequencies below 200 meters, or above 1500 kilocycles, work even better. Amateur broadcasting, or citizen radio, is popular with up to 1200 amateurs, but is prohibited in 1922 with the first broadcast licenses issued. 1923. The amateur census is at 14,000. Shortwave development continues. The Macmillan Arctic Expedition is the first to carry two-way radio, an amateur 200-meter station. Over the next years, dozens of Arctic and Antarctic expeditions, including those of Commander Byrd, used amateur radio as their primary communications. 1924. Amateurs get new bands at 80, 40, 20, and 5 meters. Spark is prohibited on the new bands. The broadcast band is expanded. The AWRL adopted Esperanto as the international auxiliary language. I bet you didn't know that. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. Hot off the presses. On the 0325 UTC pass on January 26, AMSAT Vice President of Engineering Jerry N0JY announced that AO92 had been commissioned and formally turned the satellite over to the AMSAT Operations Vice President Drew KO4MA, then declared that AO92 was now open for amateur use. Initially, the UV transponder will be open continuously for a period of one week. After the first week, operations will be scheduled between the UV FM transponder, the L band downshifter, Virginia Tech camera, and the University of Iowa's High Energy Radiation CubeSat instrument, or HERSI. Scheduled updates will appear in the ANS weekly bulletins and will also be posted to the AMSAT BB, AMSAT's Twitter account, which is 
at AMSAT, the AMSAT North America Facebook group, and the AMSAT website. If you're going to use the UVFM transponder, the downlink is 145.880, and the uplink with a 67 hertz tone is 435.350, which needs adjusting for Doppler. Thanks to the AMSAT News Service for this week's story, just in time to make some weekend passes of the new satellite. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. From the digital confines of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, with the January 20 Rain Report. Do you remember some commentaries from the 90s called Bites from QZB? A Chicago area ham named Mark Thompson, WB9, QZB expressed his often controversial ham radio viewpoints on these rain reports over 20 years ago. These days, he's wrapped up in promoting the digital side of amateur radio. So just what did his bites sound like? We'll present two of them for you this week. Here is his bites from QZB commentary he penned and voiced in early 1994. Hello, this is Mark, WB9QZB, with some bites from QZB, entitled, Your No Code Accent. First, I'd like to start this editorial by saying that I have been and continue to be one of the largest supporters of the no-code license. This license has been responsible for the significant growth of ham radio in the last couple of years. Of course, we've all heard the objections to the no-code license, but let's take a look at a different perspective. How has the no-code licensee operated on the air? The reason I bring this up is that although I don't regularly use any repeaters, I do on occasion listen to two-meter repeaters. What I've heard recently is somewhat disconcerting. While I don't want to stereotype, the first thing that tips you off to a no-coder is that they have a 1 by 3 call sign, such as N9XXX. Although in some districts, they have exhausted this block and are now issuing 2 by 3 call signs, such as KB9XXX. Many of them are familiar with using two-way radios, such as CBs, and don't seem to have any fear of talking on the radio. This is where the problem begins. It is both what they're talking about and how they're talking about it. For example, in a recent conversation, a no-coder, when asked his name, indicated that his personal was such and such. What's a personal? This is directly from CB radio. No different than if he'd said breaker 1-9. Another no-coder asked how long the other ham had been out here. Yet another CB term. But the worst example was a few weeks ago when I was listening to a wide area coverage repeater in southeastern Wisconsin. Three no-coders were chatting. One of them had his license for only a day and had a new Radio Shack HT. He asked the others how he sounded, and of course they said great. In fact, one of them said that his signal was excellent since his S meter on his radio was at 10 over 9. Mind you now, they're using a repeater here. The problem was that the new ham's audio was really very low and almost couldn't be heard but no one said anything about it. Well, this went on for a while, and finally I couldn't contain myself. I broke in politely and indicated to the one-day ham that while the signal into the repeater was okay, his audio was very low, and that he should either talk closer to the mic or adjust his mic gain. He didn't really want to believe me, nor did the other two no-coders, until another ham with 30 years of experience in the hobby also broke in and agreed with me. The question is, what's wrong with this picture? Let's start with something the American Radio Relay League, ARRL, used to call our novice accent. Many years ago, the ARRL published articles about the novice accent. The articles dealt with the fact that as new hams, novices need to learn to be good hams and follow the established procedure and decorum. I call these recent events with no-coders our no-code accent. There are two problems I see developing. First is that hams with a lot of experience are not given the advice and guidance needed by new hams. We need to help them get their equipment in good working order with on-the-air signal reports and technical advice. They need guidance from us. We need to tell them what's acceptable on ham radio and what isn't. We need to invite them to join us in ham radio events and become a complete part of the ham fraternity. The second problem is with the no-coder. 
The no coder needs to accept established procedure on ham radio. He needs to realize that although he may be comfortable talking on a radio because of his CB experience, he may have picked up some bad habits that he is going to need to shake. More importantly, he needs to accept and ask for advice from more experienced hams. Another aspect to this whole discussion is that there is more to ham radio than just buying a 2 meter HT and yakking on the repeater. One could learn code and use the HF bands. Or better yet, the no-coder could begin using our VHF and UHF bands using modes such as single sideband, CW, fast scan TV, satellites, packet, and so forth. They could get on 6 meters, 222, 432, or 1.2 gigahertz. Ham radio is to have fun with and also to experiment with. There is more to do on ham radio than most of us have the time for, but we need to continue to explore new horizons. In addition, there is much public service and emergency communications that we can also become involved in. So I encourage new hams to pay attention to all of what ham radio has to offer and take the advice of hams with many years of experience. More importantly, it is incumbent on all of us, new and old alike, to welcome the new ham and give the guidance they need. If they develop bad operating habits, we only have ourselves to blame for not nipping it in the bud early on. These have been some bites from Mark Thompson, WB9QZB, for Rain. You're listening to some of these rare moments of controversy heard on these rain reports in the 90s decades penned and voiced by Chicagoan Mark Thompson, WB9QZB. We'll bring you another Bites from QZB, this one from 1995, in a moment. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. This is Mark, WB9QZB, with another Bites from QZB editorial entitled, Repeater Frequencies, A Vast Wasteland, or Until Death Do Us Part. In 1961, FCC Commissioner Newton Minow proclaimed in a speech to the National Association of Broadcasters that television had become a vast wasteland because of the poor content and programming on television. On our VHF and UHF repeater subbands, they too have become a vast wasteland, not for what is on them, but for what is not on them. In any major city, put your scanner or radio into scan mode, scanning the 2 meter and 70 centimeter FM repeater subbands. What do you hear? Virtually nothing. That's right, nothing. No QSOs of any sort. If you get lucky, you might hear a repeater or two ID, and maybe, just maybe, a real honest-to-God QSO in progress. If the repeaters aren't closed, you could try keying them up. IDing, of course. What you hear back in response? Nothing. In some cases, immediately after you give your ID, another ham will call someone, but seemingly ignore the fact that you just gave a call yourself. How can this be? When you look in the AR repeater directory, you will see dozens of listings for repeaters in your area. When you try to key up some of these repeaters, many won't even key up, even if you use the correct tone access code, and seem to be non-existent. Yet your local analog FM repeater frequency coordination organization will tell you that all frequencies are coordinated, and that they have a multi-year waiting list to coordinate even more analog FM repeaters. What's going on here? Well, in most areas, it seems that once you get a repeater coordination, you have it until the end of your natural life. Regardless of how you make use of the frequencies, as long as you send in your membership form and dues to the Analog FM Repeater Coordination Organization every year. If you approach your coordination organization and ask them how a band can be completely allocated to repeater coordinations and yet have no activity, they might tell you that they aren't in the business to actually verify if the frequencies they coordinated years or in some cases decades earlier are actually being used. In many cases, the repeaters are at hams houses or virtually unusable due to low antenna height and provide no real useful function other than to stroke the ego of the repeater owner who can now claim he operates a repeater. In the 1970s, as demand for repeater frequencies increased, national band plans were created. In most areas, groups of repeater owners got together to form local or regional coordination organizations to alleviate potential interference. These organizations also created band plans and listings of coordinated repeaters. In the 1980s, when packet radio burst forth onto the scene, the new mode needed frequencies. In most areas, analog FM repeater coordinators weren't interested in coordinating packet frequencies and usually left the local packet club to their own devices, as long as they used packet on unused simplex frequencies and didn't use traditional analog FM pairs. In the mid-1990s, packet radio use declined due to both the advent of the Internet and the stagnation of packet radio technology. However, recently, new digital technologies have come out of the scene, such as PSK31, digital voice, and high-speed digital data. 
These new technologies will need frequencies to operate on. Digital voice repeaters such as D-Star or Apco P25 need real frequency pairs just as analog FM repeaters do. However, the difference is that digital voice is much more spectrum efficient. D-Star, for example, uses a 6.25 kHz channel, and Apco P25 uses a 12.5 kHz channel, whereas traditional analog FM uses a 20 kHz channel. One could put two or three D-Star digital voice repeaters in the frequency space used by one analog FM repeater. In addition, digital voice repeaters have a 15% greater usable range. This is because digital voice has no path noise, and at the point weak signal analog FM is noisy and virtually uncopyable, digital voice is still crystal clear. The frequency coordinators claim available frequencies in VHF and UHF are scarce and in demand. However, if you approach many coordinators and ask them how they plan to handle digital voice repeater coordinations, in many cases they will tell you that they'll figure it out once someone makes a request for a frequency pair. Once someone does make a request for a digital voice repeater pair, they are often told that they may need to wait several years for coordination until the prior requests for analog FM repeaters are satisfied. Recently, hams have been asking the FCC about digital voice technology. The FCC has said that a repeater is a simultaneous transmit and received signal. Since digital voice repeaters have an inherent delay between received and transmitted signal, some hams who have had a difficulty getting a repeater frequency pair coordinated for the digital system take this to mean it's not a repeater and doesn't need coordination. If repeater frequencies are truly scarce, then repeater coordinators should be recommending to the prior applicants of analog FM repeaters that if they resubmit a request for a spectrum efficient digital repeater instead of a non-spectrum efficient analog FM repeater, that they will be given priority. This approach would encourage hams to advance their use of technology. In the mid-1990s, the NFCC, the National Frequency Coordinators Council, was formed. It was hoped at the time that the NFCC would address the strategic issues of spectrum management and how to incorporate new technologies into existing band plans. Unfortunately, the only thing the NFCC has accomplished is to hold elections every two years, seemingly stroking the egos of the officers who are elected. So what can we as hams do? First, we can start using the valuable bands we have. We can also start identifying local FM repeaters that are either not on the air or virtually unusable and demand that our local frequency coordination organization begin decoordination of those frequencies to make way for more efficient and progressive use of those frequencies by new digital technologies, not just re-coordinating yet to more analog FM repeaters. In every other aspect of wireless communication, including commercial broadcast, cellular, and public safety, the migration of analog FM to digital has not only begun, but in some cases is nearly complete. Yet we hams are stuck using 40-year-old analog FM repeater technology. We need to hold our local repeater coordination organizations accountable and make sure they find ways to make frequencies available for these new digital technologies, which over time will become predominant even on ham radio. More importantly, we need to embrace new digital technologies, such as digital voice, like we embraced SSB 50 years ago, FM 35 years ago, and packet radio 20 years ago. We need to be the leaders in communication technology and not stuck in the past. Thanks for listening. 73, this has been Mark, WB9QZB, for Rain. If we can dislodge Mark from his digital absorption, maybe we can conjole him into writing some more bytes from QZB once again. Now for everyone connected with the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, covering for the still recuperating Will Rogers, K5WLR, and bidding you a very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Commissioning and testing continues of the L-band downshifter and the University of Iowa's High Energy CubeSat Radiation Instrument, or HERCI, on the new Fox 1D, dubbed AO92 CubeSat. The AO92 could be available for general use shortly, AMSAT said. The co-launched French PICSAT CubeSat is seeking telemetry reports. Both were carried into space from India on January 12th. AMSAT NA reports the University of Iowa tested the HERCI while the AMSAT put the L-band downshifter through its paces in the past week. The L-band downshifter converts signals received on 1267 megahertz and ejects them into the satellite's 435 megahertz receiver. Due to the increased path loss at 1267 megahertz and the use of the satellite's 435 megahertz receive antenna, the pre-launch estimates suggested that it might take about 100 watts ERP for horizon-to-horizon -horizon access in this mode. 
As always, pre-launch estimates are subject to change after real-world testing in orbit. AMSAT MA Executive Vice President Paul Stotzer and 8HM qualified. Testing was promising as the L-band downshifter was turned on for its initial outing January 20. Stotzer reports being able to access the transponder with a handheld transceiver running just one watt into a 16-element Yagi. Telemetry analysis showed the downshifter was functioning normally, and AMSAT announced open testing. Stotzer said reports flowed in of QSOs occurring over Europe and Japan. Many reported QSOs made with 10 watts or less to modest Yagi antennas. The results were similar when AO92 passed over North America. The Herky experiment was activated for the first time January 18th and intended to provide a mapping of radiation in a low Earth orbit, explained Don Kirshner, KDOL, research engineer at the University of Iowa. This is of scientific interest for planning CubeSat's test flights of low-energy X-ray detectors. The L-band downshifter operates on a 24-hour timer, he said. Tests of the various modes and experiments continue. AO-92 is on track to be commissioned and handed over to AMSAT operations this week. Meanwhile, the French PICSAT CubeSat, which was launched on the same flight as AO-92, is aimed at observing the transit of young exoplanet Beta Pictoris in front of its bright and equally young star Beta Pictoris, some 63 light years away, and at demonstrating an innovative technological concept to use fiber optical for astronomical observations from space. The CubeSat's embedded amateur radio FM transponder will be available when possible during the mission. The uplink is 145.910 MHz with a 1750 Hz tone in the amateur mode, and the downlink is 435.525 MHz, 9.6 KB BPSK AX.25 data and FM voice transmit in the amateur mode. The PicSat website includes a description of the telemetry and related information. The PICSAT team has requested amateur radio assistance to capture and upload telemetry packets from the satellite. Beacons received from all over the world are especially useful to monitor the status of the satellite along its orbit, the PICSAT team said. PICSAT shares a similar orbit with AO-92 since they were deployed at approximately the same time. The ARIS APRS packet system is not working at present. This is due to an as-yet unidentified anomaly involving the radio serving the system on board the ISS. A similar problem has occurred in the past, and steps taken to resolve the problem have proven to be only temporary. According to a statement released by ARIS, the system may return to service as it has in the past, or it may have finally failed completely. ARIS sees the delivery of the interoperable radio system as the true solution to securing our ARIS packet operation. The target for delivery and installation of the replacement system is this coming fall. In the meantime, ARIS said it's continuing to investigate the problem and attempt to fix it. The ARIS team knows many radio amateurs really enjoy using the ARIS APRS packet system and thanks everyone for understanding the issues involved with not having it available. The Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, or ARDEN, project team has donated several pieces of high-speed multimedia mesh, or HSMM, hardware to the ARRL laboratory. HSMM technology has evolved rapidly in recent years due to the development efforts of the A. Arden Project's open source. This has changed the complexion of mesh implementations from an experimental hobby-oriented novelty into a viable alternative network suitable for supporting high-speed emergency communication and internet connectivity, said Arden's Randy Smith, WUTS. To further our shared goal of supporting agency responders, Arden has donated a substantial kit of mesh networking equipment to ARRL for its familiarization and deployment. Smith said both ARRL and Arden would work together to provide written guidance on the best practices for using the network capability to provide such services as voice over IP telephony, streaming video, and email. Arden was used to provide connectivity during the 2016 New York City Marathon. The Arden Project was working with ARRL to inform the amateur radio community about this high-speed, low-cost networking technology. The hardware donated includes two Ubiquiti Nanostation M3s for 3.4 GHz, two Ubiquiti Nanostation Loco M5s for 5.8 GHz, one Powerbeam PBE M5 300 ESO for 5.8 GHz, and one Air Router HP, a combination of 2.4 GHz and Ethernet switch. 
ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, notes that Arden repurposing of the 3.3 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi equipment will allow amateur radio to provide alternative modern high-speed digital communication for both routine and emergency applications. These capabilities, combined with the proven track record of amateur radio to deploy communication systems under a wide range of adverse conditions, showcase the capabilities of amateur radio in a technological world, he said. Hare said the AWR lab has deployed a local Arden network at AWRL headquarters and plans to expand its scope to include nodes on the W1AW towers and other equipment installed at local police, fire, and communications at hospital centers. Smith said that amateur radio mesh networking has come a long way in the last five years and that Arden Project is leading further advancement. We've increased the number of usable devices and increased the data throughput speeds, he said. Hams around the country have set up permanent installations that enable voice over IP telephony, streaming video cameras, mesh chat keyboard messaging, file transfer, and email systems. Much of Southern California is already Arden networked and ready to support established relationships with emergency operations centers and disaster agencies. Smith suggested that Arden Mesh Networking is an ideal way to engage hams who are interested in computers, programming, and data communications networks. Our focus is meeting 21st century expectations, he said. Those interested in assisting the Arden team can contact Smith. The Arden project is looking for people who can contribute to embedded Linux kernel development base on OpenWRT, an application development to address the needs of emergency responders and production of educational guides and videos to explain application configurations and web development to support Arden.org website. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, January 26th. The sun is spotless today and remarkably quiet. For the first time in months, there are no coronal holes in the sun's atmosphere, which means no strong blasts of solar wind to disrupt the HF bands. A very quiet sun translates to a low solar flux index in the upper 60s to maybe around 70. The low band should be very good this weekend, but conditions are likely to be mediocre at best, above 30 meters. On VHF and UHF, you might recall that last week we were talking about significant activity in the upper central states and the Midwest. Well, that's still the case this week. In addition, tropo openings are occurring in the southeast and in parts of Arizona and New Mexico. And finally this week, for many years, unidentified radio broadcasts have been transmitting coded messages using numbers such as 67926-56990. Even today, tuning across the HF spectrum typically will yield a number station, a mechanical sounding voice, male or female, methodically announcing groups of single digit numbers for minutes on end. According to Radio World, you may have tuned into a spy agency's number station, transmitting coded instructions to their minions worldwide. Shades of the Americans' TV spy drama, where characters routinely receive coded messages via radio. Number station transmissions typically consist of a voice reading out strings of seemingly random numbers, explain Lewis Bush, author of Shadows of the State, a new history of number stations. These are sometimes accompanied by music, tones, or other sound effects, he said. Paul Beaumont, an associate editor of iSpy Intelligence magazine, a publication dedicated to espionage and intelligence, is quoted in the Radio World article as saying, voice number stations are known to be spy messages. The article said that one of the best-known number stations was the Lincolnshire Poacher, so-called due to its use of the Lincolnshire Poacher folk song played on a pipe organ as an identifier. Radio amateurs used direction-finding equipment to pin down the station's eventual location to an RAF base on Cyprus, according to the article. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. 
If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.